Good evening, you beautiful, positive people. Welcome to TCB Studios. Welcome to Burn It Down. First things first, I'd like to apologize about not having a show last week. We had some technical difficulties that were out of our control. But there's one thing I've learned. I've been working in television a little over seven years now. My partner, Joe Sanchez, told me, it's not open heart surgery. No one is going to die. It is just TV. So I apologize that we weren't on, but we will make up that episode and have that very special guest, Renee Jaworski, our awesome producer, director, person in the back driver's seat, killing it every week. We will have her back on, I believe, November 14th. That's what I'm shooting for. I want to give a shout out to my brother, Patrick Cole, for giving me this awesome Batman hat. I want to give a shout out to Jameson for sending me this beautiful winter toboggan. I got to jump right in. I got to get going. Tonight's guest is tremendous, tremendous talent um, and uh, a huge influence on me as a writer, as a poet, as a musician, as a drummer, as a screamer, um, as a person who fights for things that are right, who uh, uses his voice for people who don't have a voice, as a dancer, as a husband, as a father, just all across the board, a uh, wonderful entertainer, Mr. Bill Taft. Please hit the stage. How are you, my brother? Boy, really good. So glad to be here, Tom. This is going to be fun. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you have been on my mind. You're on my mind a lot. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were just having a blast talking backstage in the green room, which we realized that should be another show. <laughs> you know, uh, the conversations we have back there prepping for this. And we say, well, let's not say too much because we're going to say so much in the episode. Like, I know for a fact we're going late on this one, you know, because there's so much to say. But if I had one complaint, if someone says, yo, What's your problem with Bill Taft? I'd be like, I do. I have one complaint. I don't see him enough because it seems like we only get lucky in this life and bump into each other at a show or I'm at a show you're playing or vice versa once every two years. And uh, we need to we need to make that stop. We need to make that change and maybe see each other like twice a year. And we would have played a show together if it hadn't been yeah. for the hurricane. So we yeah. actually had a chance, but then the weather, the hurricane came and then the show got canceled and the hurricane didn't come. So that yeah. is- and it, and, it was, it was a, and it was a very important uh, charity event, uh, which basically was for voters. And uh, I also believe that project, Stacey Abrams uh, is very involved in, and I'm a fan, so anytime I can use my voice to help people go out and think and vote and get involved with their community, I'm down to do it. And we even talked. You texted me. You said, well, why don't we do a song together? We, we were going to actually perform together. That's right. Dirty Old Town, the Pogues mm -hmm. version. And that would have been a deep way to connect this present moment. Yeah to a more important historical moment about people in town struggling against injustice. That's how I see it. That's what I'm saying. And that's why I was saying those words. Uh, uh, freedom fighter, poet, because the thing is, is your style uh, and your approach to music, I absolutely love it because it's completely original and it's your own. And that's what I've tried to do. And uh, we mentioned that. So I'd like to give a shout out to Brian Holleran as well. I first came on the scene in the mid nineties to Atlanta from New York. And I had all these ideas going through my head um, as a musician, uh, as a not a very good musician, <laughs> you know, uh, as not the best songwriter, you know, but I had all these ideas and so much excitement. And one, you guys were just so generous with your time 
and words of wisdom and advice. And I'll never forget it. And I appreciate it so much. And uh, much love and respect to you guys for that. So thank you. Yeah, and that's really what my state of mind was at or where I was at, too, at the time. I mean, I was lost. I wanted to be a songwriter and a musician, and I did not know what I was doing. But I had the good fortune to be able to meet Benjamin and work with him. So as I worked with him and Brian Halloran, we all sort of workshopped ideas together. Benjamin, I think, was really the the sort of artist leader. He was so so magical. Incredible talent. Chris Lopez on guitar, Alan Mm -hmm. Page on drums, and Todd Butler uh, playing guitar and lap steel. And Todd Butler is essential to understanding the whole Benjamin story. He is another big part of Atlanta music history. He was in Wee Wee Pole with Rue Paul back in wow, the uh, amazing. Uh, and his wife, Claire Butler, was in Now Explosion. So Todd and Claire really worked with Benjamin, I think, to help him uh, develop his ideas. And he helped me and Brian and, and Lopez develop our ideas. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I, I still listen to the Mary Tyler Moore theme on regular um, uh, and uh, clean white bread, clean white bed and uh, Christmas. Uh, you know, the Oval Fox record, um, the Popsicle Stick record is play, plays regularly in TCB studios. I wasn't lucky enough to see Oval Fox, but I saw um, Smoke at the Claremont Lounge. And I saw you guys open up for Mark Rabot, Tom Waits' guitar player, at the, the Variety Playhouse. That's right. That's right. Great show. Yes. I remember uh, Benjamin goes, everyone says I sound a little like Tom Waits. Well, my question is, is what's he waiting for? <laughs> yeah, he was so, so, he never told the same joke. Twice. No. You know, he was every every joke was new. Every, every funny comment was original. Uh, lovely, lovely. And and so I have these uh rules that I give myself. And if everyone is different, you know, like uh like I, I wouldn't feel right about like getting on stage if I'm doing a cover or whatever and looking at the lyrics to a song on my phone. So what I'll do is paint like words on my boots or my shoe or paint it on on pieces of cardboard and tape it on the stage. So then I'm looking down and I see the first three words. Then my muscle memory tells me I know the rest of this line. And uh, he made it somehow look cool to have a notebook and open it up and read his lyrics. That's and that was, a you know, one of the things that I learned about him is how disposable words should be that was really part of his whole writing oh my goodness concept. he would just write the words and then lose the notebook and he would just yeah. say well, someone I don't someone know. write that someone write that down he just how, write disposable more words. Words, yeah. how disposable words should be right now yeah. that's what i and it's important because he just let them come to him and he let them go when it was time to go and that meant he always had real you know vital words that meant something and Oh uh, he, he, uh, that really meant a lot to me that he, he knew how impermanent language could be. Uh, and he, he just always created space for new language. But, but the truth is he had enough copies backed up of the good stuff that oh I think he always had a way to, to keep the, the winning song lyrics that meant a lot to him. I think that's the key to it is one practice what you're doing. Everyone out there, whether you're writing songs or writing poems, keep doing it and try to sharpen this tool. I carry cardboard. I'll cut up a pizza box and put it in my back, back pocket with a Sharpie. And throughout the day, I'll see something and I write it down. And that's just for me, you know, and I, you're only going to get better at it. Um, and, and, and even if it's not a good poem or song, I mean, you used your brain and your heart that day. I mean, I remember uh, a quote that, uh, Nick Cave said about um, Shane McGowan once, and he said uh, he probably has songs he threw away in his kitchen garbage pail that will destroy songs, <laughs> anything that you've tried to write, <laughs> like his throwaways, you know. And uh, my goal is just to keep on writing, and uh, you've been such a big influence uh, in that area because I love watching you perform. So, I, a couple of things one is um, 
the smoke movie i was lucky enough to see to go to two q and a's um and uh, one was at the the plaza and then i was going back and forth to new york city and i got to go to uh see it on canal street no it was on houston street i'm sorry and uh, the east village and i got to meet jim cohen who also produced who also directed i might say the fugazi movie instrument and yeah. i got to say oh I met you a couple of weeks ago in atlanta and we chatted about that that movie is absolutely uh just stunning to watch it gets sad because of Benjamin's life, but also it just shows one, the coolest part of Atlanta, you know, when Atlanta just, I mean, just unbelievable. It was just, it just spit and breathed art. And like I was telling you backstage, um, anytime a friend comes into town and I take him to the Majestic for a cup of coffee, the diner, or we get a pint, we go get a beer or a glass of wine at the register room. We look across the street and, and everyone goes, there's the building that looks like a birthday cake. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That was, <laughs> Yeah, that was, I would visit Benjamin there, and that was even then he was writing, yeah, and welcoming oh, me, and you know? and he I visited him one time, and he gave me uh, uh, records he found in the trash. I think these were seventy eights of La Traviata mm -hmm. he'd found in oh, someone's trash. But um, he, then he gets he gave me the 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 78s of La Traviata, but that's where Benjamin, even near the end, as he's facing, you know, the reality of flesh and it's impermanence, oh you know, he's, he's thinking of others and, and giving them stuff. Yeah. And and which, a lot. Even to the end and that, that right there, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm taking mental notes and after this, we'll be writing half of these things, these little snippets down. Because I, I get into this conversation a lot, whether I'm interviewing someone or they're interviewing me. And the life of an artist or a musician, sometimes our loved ones, our lovers, our partners, it's rough on them. And they could think that we're selfish. But I also think, on the other hand, you, I think we're selfless. Because yeah, we that's... are always trying to give, you know. And yeah, and then you listen and then you got to give more. Now, my wife will say that I'm a passive aggressive stick in the mud at times, too. Yeah, so let's give, clear. let's give, 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 Shout out to the wife who uh, who yeah. uh, kind of mans mans the ship. Otherwise, you know, yeah. uh, I was thinking about that record that he he gave you because um, you used to listen to a lot of jazz, and uh, I think one of the first times I met you was through our partner Chad Radford. Ch shout out to Chad, and he even put out uh, a couple of records on his label. One was Hubcap City that you put out, and one was the early version of West End Motel. And uh, I'm proud to say we're label mates as well. And Chad was like yes bill is this eccentric beautiful proper awesome weirdo but he does it all right and so you're listening to these jazz records i i really believe one of the first times i met you you you, you were riding by on a bicycle and i think you had an old record player on your back playing an old yeah. an old 40s record you stopped and you go i just found this cheap bottle of red wine you want some i'm like hell yeah and I'm like, because the thing is, is when we try to find our voice, the whole the whole time, our whole life, we should be works works in progress. But hopefully, you find this iconic thing that works for you. That's your voice. That's just like, well, then this is my thing. You know, like the way I want to deliver stories, the way I want to scream stories. Because I remember. In 2011, before I moved to New York, I put out a book called Just a Little Piece of Heartburn. And I reached out to you, and I was not not Whoa, in the best place. Oh, my goodness. There it yeah. is. Oh, <laughs> Man, we didn't, Autograph. And, and, yeah, and we didn't plan that at all. Um, so, oh. um, But I asked you to do some reading from it. And uh, it was kind of an emotional time in my life. And one thing I'm not going to do is tell you how to read it. I, I think I gave you three poems to read and you just like, I think at one point and the place was packed and you just stepped on this wooden box and all of a sudden transformed into like a 1940s preacher. And you're like, woman, 
you've hurt me for the last time. And you're like, but she was a sweetheart. She was smoking cigars when she was four, like whatever it was. And I was like crying and just like, I've never even imagined this poem came this way, you know? And, and you fast forward. The poem I read was one you'd written on plywood. I yes, that's it right. It was on plywood, and then it, you sort of painted the plywood. So it was like not just a poem. It was an original kind of work of art. Mm -hmm. And the plywood itself mm -hmm. had a gravitational force. Oh, my right. God. Yeah, and so, yeah, so you're reading in between the lines, even, of the wood. And then you fast forward uh, 10 years, and luckily, I'm very proud to say I'm doing a trillion times better. Life has been wonderful to me uh, in all aspects, and I just feel like a lucky man. But you fast forward 10 years, and our brother, Jeffrey Butzer, uh, a peer of ours who we're fans with, he puts out a book. And he asked me to read from it recently. And uh, and I go, I'm going all I'm going all uh, I'm going all Bill Taft on this, you know, and I'm reading from his book and I'm like screaming and stuff. Unbeknownst to me that you're going to be in the crowd and I see you afterwards. I'm like, what you think? And you're like, man, you hit all the verbs. That's right. Yeah, because that's the power. And that's, you know, you do that with your singing, too. I mean, that's the, what the audience needs. They need to feel the weight and the force of the action in every line and the verbs do that so. oh my goodness i there's so many projects um that i still feel like i'm and i love that it's like layer uh pulling off this wonderful awesome onion and rediscovering because you go back with working with so many wonderful people you mentioned chris lopez i mean chris lopez is one of atlanta's greatest songwriters you know i mean unbelievable shout out to him but um we were talking a little bit about um Michael Stipe, because he did work with you on some records, but then he worked with you on producing actually the Smoke movie. And I didn't know if he was hands on, but it sounds like he actually was hands on and was caring, but also he, he cared, but also he cared enough that, listen, you guys need to step up. Yeah, he really supported, you know, Opal Fox. You know, he really saw Benjamin's talent and, and, artistry so he started supporting benjamin with opal fox quartet and he produced their first album and mm -hmm. they recorded at john Keane's studio in athens and you know michael was really help, you know he was supporting but he also challenged the band to come up with some money to help pay for recording costs which i think right. was a great idea it wasn't so much money they couldn't do it it was just enough money that they had to realize we got to get it together. We cannot just right. take money from the Claremont Lounge and go get high for a week. Right. We like, yes, don't we spend did. it. Don't it. Yes, like and it was no good. five dollar bag. Yeah. Uh, and so everyone got over to John Keane's studio in Athens, and Vic Chestnut would come in. Um, oh my god, I love and, this. You know, Michael really just wanted. He created a space where Benjamin and Chris Lopez and Todd Butler and Brian and Alan Page and Connie Hayes could be themselves. Uh, he really created a space which was very similar to our, the way we wrote songs as a group. And we used to practice over at Connie's house and it was a, in the studio. It was like being uh, on stage at the uh, uh, Little Five Points pub. He just created a space where the musicians could hear well, each yeah, other. Could you because you hear them talking about that. It's like, welcome to the little five points, Papa. And you hear um, you hear this clatter. So it's either one, it's a, I love the idea that it's called the Opa Fox Quartet, but there's like 13 people in the band, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then, and then like um, maybe friends and uh, you, like you said, Vic Chestnut coming over, other people in the room. And it's like, there really was a sense of like camaraderie, camaraderie in them community and brotherly and sisterly love i'm like what the hell is that noise oh it's uh so-and-so doing a tap dance solo oh what's this it's someone banging on a refrigerator you know and that was just why i think working with benjamin was was so powerful he was a very uh powerful center of gravity now i, I was not i was able to visit when they recorded the opal fox album with michael stipe i couldn't be there to play because i was mm -hmm. traveling with the Jody grind. Um, yes. And, but, you know, Michael continued to support Benjamin with smoke, uh, with the smoke. Right. Record. The second one, another reason to fast, we recorded with John Barbie 
Um, and, you know, that was a really uh, fun time in Athens. I love it. I well, and I love the Jody grind, and then um, everything you di did after that as well. I mean, that's what I'm saying. I keep on feeling like, and it's a lucky place to be. It's like a, it's like a kid just discovering the Pogues. Oh my goodness, you're gonna have a great next ten years. You know, it's like a kid just discovering, you know, the first uh, Island Records albums by Tom Waits. You know, Rain Dog, Selfish and Bones, and Frank's Wild Years. I'm like man, I, I wish I could rediscover that stuff. And that's how some of us feel about with you because well, even now, Waiting for Your Foes is like the best band name and it's the best band. And so I, we, when we reached out to each other and we were going to do this Stacey Abrams thing, you know, and then do a song together. Um, again, like I said, rock on the vote, man. It's all, you got to get people out there. You know, it's, it's a wonderful cause, but then we started texting each other more and I was like, Hey, let's take a road trip. Let's go, let's go see Wes at El Rocco in Savannah. You know, let's go play a show in Chattanooga. And I know it's rough work, family life, but, uh, just got to try to get out there and do some more shows together so we can hang out. And you know, the conversation, you know, the, you got to, before the show, you get to hang out, and then you're talking, you know, before the show. But the set itself is a way to talk uh, oh, to each yeah. other too, um, and that's what you know. I love your set at the Elmir anniversary show. Thank you so much. You were talking to each other with the band. You were actually kind of talking to me about mm -hmm. you know a lot of the music that influenced me because mm -hmm. in the late eighties. I was in uh, New York City and I played on the street. I had a battery powered amp and I would just go around town and uh, set up on street corners and I'd play the guitar on the street with other musicians and we'd make some good money. People would throw dollar bills into the uh, oh my guitar. Goodness, I love it. So then I'd take the money and then I would go see a show that night at the Ritz or Irving Plaza and one of the shows. I went down there. I was like, the Dead Kennedys are playing. I'm gonna go see the Dead oh, Kennedys. Oh, lovely, yeah. So I was excited about that. But before the Dead Kennedys played, this other band came on, and I didn't know who they were. I just looked up and I saw these these guys coming out. And there was a guy with an accordion, and I thought, well, that's unusual. And then a guy with a banjo, and I thought, well, that's a little unusual. And then the drummer comes out, but he's not sitting down. He's standing behind these right. these these uh drums then the the girl comes out playing the bass and she has this great black Kato Reardon, Elvis Costello's right. wife time. Then, yes. then, then they come out and then they start playing and it's just you know sick bed of Kill Collins, something like oh that. I have no idea who the pose were, but instantly I felt them and the whole room erupted. I mean yeah. I saw this the the crowd became one dancing mm -hmm. Um, oh, I got chills right now. I'm living by kerosene um, too for from that. It was, all, it was all acoustic music. I lo I loved it, and they and they they set up in a line. It was a line yeah. of of, of uh, musicians, and I thought, "What is that? What? What?" And that was the oh first my goodness, song. totally changed. Uh, yeah, and, and, music. and chain uh, uh, will go down in history as one of the finest. You know. Um, uh, lyricists, I, I, I always laugh and quote uh, him the other day, just the other day, I, I said to a friend, I was like, uh, bury me at sea where no murdered ghosts can haunt me. If I walk <laughs> yeah. around the shores, yeah. let me go, boys, let or, me go. Or, boys. The, the title song, uh, the title song from Hell's Dish that Joe Strummer produced and certainly big influence on me as well. Uh, uh, I know the Clash and the Pogues played together so much back in the day, but the title song of Hell's Dish, the first line, he comes out, he, he goes, well, life's a bitch and then you die black hell. Like, like that's, right. the, I'm like, that's more metal than any death metal band. Mm -hmm. Like that is amazing. Like that lyric is unreal. Life is hell. <laughs> life's a bitch. Life's a bitch. And then you die black hell. Uh, that's amazing. But then you go from that and then you're on your own path, you know, and, and then you're playing. And rainy night in Soho. So I mean, Shane covers it all. And then it's, you know, and the, the truth of, you know, I'm singing about, you know, some of our friends went to heaven. Some of them went to hell, 
Uh, so he's really covering the, the loss and the love, the, the fighting and the yeah. drama. Uh, and I'm and so glad we covered that. Your version too, man. Your version picked yeah. up on that, but you made it your own version. So as you were yeah. saying, that, you were talking to me, uh, and I was thinking yeah. about the past, uh, and then you're making the past come alive in the present, at least for me. Thank you for seeing that and noticing it. And I saw you singing along. I mean, I love that song, and I really don't think there's much anyone can do to make it better than it is, so the best thing you do is make it your own. So I basically, I think I sing the first three lines, and then I changed all the lyrics, and and, and I talk about I'm now you and I are on a boat, and I'm never going to leave you, you know? And um, it's important because, you know, you, you have your influences, but then, like you said, whether it's a cover or something that you're doing, you want to make it your own yeah, and you have to give it your own voice yeah and I, the other great thing is I think your version was a little slower which creates mm -hmm. for your voice to get more forceful so you were walking around under that under that tent space uh, yeah, but yeah. interacting with people it was really you know this this profound spirit oh, of a of a shaman getting lost within the the, oh the my goodness. of the music, so I loved it. I thought I think some people were healed. Uh, oh my goodness! Well, listen, I, I like listen and like and I talk about this. You know, I don't want this. I love uh, I love sharing stories. And I want our, our viewers to learn more about you, but I also want them to see two friends who admire each other having great conversation, like I had with Chad Radford two weeks ago. It's just it's like when you're fans of people and you and you have the same passions and you love the same things and you certainly hate the same things. That's why we love freedom fighters. That's why we love people who speak for the people who have no voice and. And then you just share these stories because watching you is like going to church. And that's what I was going to say, because and then you have your influences and then you find out someone like Patty Smith is a fan of yours and she wants to come see you play. And that has to be uh, the most amazing feeling because I don't get starstruck and I've met so many of my heroes and I shop um, on 14th Street um, and Fifth Avenue all the time in New York because every Wednesday and every Sunday they have an outdoor, uh, basically a flea market, but selling like vegetables and stuff. And um, I was basically buying some fruit and I looked next to me, this just a couple of years ago and right next to me is Patty Smith. And I go, and I just looked at him and went, how you doing? I just walked away. I was like, too much respect. You're such a beautiful, awesome human and artist. I don't want to bother you today. And I just said, how you doing? Just walked away. And you got Patty Smith coming, wanting to come see you. That's just so amazing. Just an incredible you know, life force. And you know, she has saved a lot of a lot of people. I mean, Benjamin oh really listened to her constantly and always referred to her work. Yeah, you know, I think she's just one of those artists who saved benjamin and gave him a reason you know to keep putting up with just the i think the crap he worked through as a as a young right. man and a man who wanted to be a writer you know she reached out yeah. to him gave him a reason uh to keep yeah, struggling yeah, she, she may have been uh, a huge part of the reason why he was continual writing until the day he passed you know yeah. and uh, that is just so uh beautiful and we're we're so lucky to have people like that you know um I, I just went and saw um, the new David Bowie documentary. I suggest anyone go see it. It, it is absolutely beautiful. Uh, the first 40 minutes is a painted, very noisy collage of just gorgeous colors, bright colors and noise and his music, but in parts, certain parts really loud and you're trying to figure it out. If you like mushrooms, maybe you should take them when you see it. But the last 40 minutes is just a story of his life. And he talks about his, his brother who had schizophrenia. And he was always nervous that he would eventually, something would happen to him. And that hit close to home. I have, you know, I've had mental illness in my family. And um, and there are certain parts I got teary-eyed. And just, he was like, oh, my goodness, this is too real, but too too awesome and too honest and too incredible and i appreciate it and also people asking him questions He's like this i'll give to you i'll give you my songs i'll give you my poems i'm not giving you this no, that is none of your business who cares if i'm wearing earrings or high heels you know and one of I mean, he, I, he we're so lucky we had him on loan you know he was wonderful and you know changed people taught them you know how to see the potential in them you know themselves and i think that's why we need artists and artists who can talk about the 
the things most people probably can't talk about. Um, right. Because it is, uh, you know, I was lost where I was lost until I found uh, Benjamin. I think Deacon Lunchbox helped me out a lot. And you know, oh my good, another Dan another Allen. one, rest in peace. Yeah, and David Barbie in Athens who produced that record. He was just another calm, centering force too, who helped me figure stuff out. Yeah, I just bumped into David recently, uh, and he and I've been in the studio with him, and he's one lovely to work with, and it's just such a awesome another athens legend or just georgia state of georgia legend love him um i um i wanted to, I, I wanted to say one more thing that um i because i have these loose notes written everywhere so i just look at them kind of like that trick i do on stage with writing words down on shoes and on pieces of tape on the floor so i'm looking at this and another really really huge thing that i want to thank you for I think Chad Chad Radford certainly uh, was very instrumental in, in, in us getting close. So thank you, Chad. Um, but also uh, you and Brian, again, you um, you not only were so hospitable hollering, um, but you you were very just generous with your time and and words of wisdom, you know. And um, but you invited me to take part and also help curate and host a thing called the Garbage Man, an evening with the Garbage Man. That's right. And look at this. I'm. Original oh artwork. Original artwork. Oh there my god! Yeah, so writers, writers of all kind are welcome. Yes, and I mean, you really are a collector. That's amazing. Um, but that was such, I think this that matters. was such a magical. That was such a magical time. Yeah. Look at that. The return uh, of the garbage man. Because I'm oh, <laughs> drinking cider, drank Irish cider piss. <laughs> I was drinking a lot of ciders back then. You were on the red wine and I was on the ciders. Yeah. Um, because I believe you had something called an evening with the garbage man. And to explain to our viewers is, is you would say, find something in a dumpster or in the garbage. It could be a bag of chips or whatever. Okay. It, might be, it might be a letter that someone wrote to break up with a lover. And you might read that, but you also might decide to improvise and add to it. Yeah, that was part of, what was it? Was, yeah, I was interested in storytelling. And that was, you know, really the original Garbage Man shows go back to right around the white time of the white dot and the star bar when Faye Lynn was booking shows at the oh star. Oh, my show. goodness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, loved what we were doing in the Jody Grind and Opal Fox. And she just let me uh, book shows one night uh, a month. So there would be bands or artists and filmmakers, and I would just – do puppet shows between the uh, the performers. So it was very vaudeville, uh, but it was a chance to just that. work with storytelling uh, in a in a bar space, which I think is very important. Star Bar is great. It's because it's a place where you can really share ideas, and it's good to drink right. beer. And yeah, had, had a bar vibe. I think. Me too, and I've always loved the idea of like. I mean, listen, uh, you know, I love, I love so, I love so and so, I love this band, but I don't need four bands that sound like them. How about we have a comedian? How about we have a guy get up on stage and juggle? And then when a guy's playing an acoustic guitar and his friend's banging on a toaster over for drums, they're just setting up and then let the real band go on after that. I, I don't even mean the real band, I mean the different band. But the thing is, is, is you're turning into this beautiful, gorgeous, whole curated night of, of variety. Yeah, and that's what, you know, speaking of that, I was able to see the show at No Tomorrow, a gallery space in underground Atlanta, uh, curated by Priscilla Smith. And I think that night it was Majid. Majid curated a night of performances and improvisations. And just one of the moments that stood out was LaDonna Smith, a legendary improviser, uh, working with Lucifer, who is a dancer who translated LaDonna Smith's violin playing into movement. It oh was goodness. incredible. The I am sure. Famous, it was a conversation. So just as we are talking now, they were talking in the space, uh, no tomorrow. And oh it just, the movements of Lucifer changed the way I heard the music of LaDonna and the music of LaDonna changed the way I saw Lucifer. It was it was just uh, it's back and forth it, it and, and transformational. 
Uh, and you explaining it, me living vicariously through you, I'm seeing my own version of it, and I can't wait to see that, you know. And that's what it's all about. Yeah, and that is just, you know, it's mixing it up, having different artists working together and not knowing what is going to happen, uh, but creating a space yeah. where the unknown can the, happen. Yeah, the element of surprise is okay, too. I mean, you know, it's it's like you mentioned this thing that Benjamin taught you, and I know for a fact he taught you because I watched you. Uh, I think I flew into town like right before the pandemic and we were doing something near each other. It was maybe a show for Henry at 529. That sounds about right. And waiting for UFOs is playing. My point being this, you mentioned that Benjamin taught you this thing to like words. You could just, you, you could write this one out, throw the other one out. Interchangeable, uh, all these different things. Mm -hmm. And you have this flow when you deliver. And, and also talk about very normal things. You're like, I went down to the store and they didn't have the, the, the white bread I was looking for, but I wasn't going to let it ruin my day. And it's like you're screaming that into the audience, you know. And then all of a sudden you see me in the corner of your eye in this packed club and you're like, you're like, and then I made a phone call and I try to, re I try to reserve a room at the West End Motel like that. And I'm just like, man, he's just you're brilliant at just doing this. And um, I want to get better at that. And I think more artists should do that. Switch words out. Why wouldn't you, if you have a song about the city of Chicago, but when you're playing New Jersey, switch it out and say you're in New Jersey. Uh, make people, um, make, make it make it feel like, because I, I always have felt that the crowd is so much part of the show. Don't let it be that you're separated. Involve them. And it's, it creates a conversational effect. But it's tricky. I wish I knew how to do it because some nights I can't even talk. I just can't even talk. I have nothing to say. It's like I'm overwhelmed with some different thing, you know. Then other nights I can't shut up. And then other nights I, I can sort of talk and it's embarrassing. <laughs> then I shut myself up. But it's 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 a mystery to me. I wish I could turn it on or off. I can't. Uh, uh, it's a mysterious forest time. Huh? Oh, my goodness. I'm going to be sharing, uh, and Renee as well, and again, a shout out to Renee and the driver's seat. I couldn't do half of this uh, or any of this without you, so appreciate you. I'm going to be sharing any information because I have the new Waiting for UFOs record, and it is awesome. Uh, links to maybe, whether it's Bandcamp, whatever, any shows you have coming up, because I see you have a really cool show coming up. Uh, I guess, is it is it at the Star Bar? Let's see, I, November, I think it's Saturday, November 5th, Chomp and Stomp. We're going to be playing Chomp, um, Chomp. on the Gaskell Street stage, which is going to be a big deal because Benjamin and Coleman used to live on Gaskell Street. Oh, wow, uh, so I love those teams. Street, so we'd practice, uh, we'd write some songs on, in their apartment on Gaskell Street. Then the following mm -hmm. Saturday, we're playing at the Star Bar with Pylon Reenactment Society. That uh, mm -hmm. Magna Pop and we are magic. Uh, so that's yeah, going to be a, that's, an, that's a huge show with a bunch of legends. Shout out to Coleman as well and Benjamin and us. This kind of uh, I'm getting really I'm getting a little bit better at this with my show where I work out my segues. Uh, this gets to a point of the show where I I really did want to mention uh, Deacon Lunchbox as well. Um, Shane McGowan in that song says some of some of our friends went to heaven and some of them went to hell. And uh, you and I, along with challenge, challenging each other and uh, complimenting each other, but also challenging each other, giving each other poetic challenges. Like, I need you to write a poem about egg salad, you know, whatever. Uh, we've had these wonderful conversations, and thank you for that. But also... We've talked about uh, demons, whether you dance with them, whether you fight with them. I've learned to embrace them because if you fight them, you might win today. But three weeks later, it'll take you over and then you're a goner. And uh, some of the ones that we've lost over the years, uh, shout out to all of them. So much love and respect and wonderful, nothing but wonderful memories. But I'm really proud uh, that we're here having this conversation. Yeah, that, yeah. I'm glad we are here, too, because this is, I mean, I guess we could have, if I were, you know, not on this planet, if I'd shoved off this mortal coil, we'd probably still be having the conversation. But I'd be a it's so fun, a little, it's so fun, a little cooler. cooler. But this yeah, is so good. Um, I'm glad we're able to do it now.
uh, because me too. tomorrow I'm not here. I might not. There might be, you know, no tomorrow uh, for me. So I'm glad. No. But there's going to be one. Don't get scared. I'm just. No, no, there is. And uh, and continue writing, everyone, um, and continue dreaming and uh, uh, wake up and write down your dreams. Because I know if I could remember my dreams, I do. And I love where they go and where they take me. And um, again, I just want to say, um, and I know I've said this before, but it feels really, really huge to be able to say this on my own show to you in front of my viewers is uh, thank you so much for your kindness, for your time, for your energy, for your constant inspiration. And uh, but I guess just most of all, just being a mate and being a friend for your friendship. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tom, for your you know, your music, your heart, uh, your words, uh, and the song Forgiveness, because oh that song God. had a big impact uh, on me recently. Uh, speaking about demons, there are demons in the lyric of that song. Yeah, uh, there are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. What a terrible thing to say. Yeah, uh, uh, lust, 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 pride, lust, yeah, lust, it, pride, and envy. Yeah. Lust, lust, pride, and envy, what an awful thing to say yes. as the demons fight inside me. There's no one here to guide me. Yes. That's uh, it. Yeah. That's, that was, that's been good. That was, that, was that was a rough year. That was a rough year. Uh, I, I forwarded your text to about four different people, and now we told Renee a little bit about this dream that you have. And it's almost like uh, it's almost like apocalypse now. <laughs> no, no, yeah. but it's it's happy, it's, uh, it's, spreading, it's spreading positivity instead of shooting these 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 horrible gases and guns and and poison on people. It's shooting positivity and saying, "Listen, we're going to get through this." Um, forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. We know now what we've done. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. I can't make it on my own. Meaning, we all need to do this together. And that's uh, that's so. My vision is to get some money and get some helicopters with speakers, uh, oh my audio God. speakers, and then the helicopters will fly over the city of Atlanta. And the song "Forgiveness," uh, performed by TCB and, and the West End Motel version, yeah. will have yeah. to be a loop. So your words will wash across the city. Uh, and it will be a chance for the people to listen and learn, and they they probably won't learn, but I think they need to learn, um, right? And they need to hear that message, you know, peace, love, and understanding. Peace, love, and understanding. Yeah, and the end it goes hope, faith, and charity, that's because right. that's what it all comes down to. And uh, and it's and it's like it's like us to to our last days, just uh, keep on giving and giving people words and uh, and building them up. And that's, I think, to me, it, it, the interesting thing is I was flying into LaGuardia to visit some family in New York. And so the plane is, it's this Delta plane, and it's coming right over the Manhattan. And I'm looking mm -hmm. out the seat, the window. I was in seat 24F, I think. And I'm looking at the window, and then forgiveness comes on my, my, little, my little earbuds on uh, mm -hmm. On my phone, and so I'm listening to you sing forgiveness, and I'm I'm hearing those words and looking down at the people, and I'm thinking the people need to hear this song. The oh my goodness! Need to hear the lyrics of this song, uh, and I so I kind of imagined them hearing it and then not hearing it, and I thought that is the curse of existence. Uh, oh my to, to have the truth and know the people don't listen to the truth, and then the plane landed. So I thought this that was an, a mystical experience to hear those Chill, chills and arm hairs and braille, chills and arm hairs and braille, and then slight tears coming down my face right now. Yeah, peace, November love, and understanding. Stop. What a lovely yeah. thing, to say. thing to say. Yes. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I actually changed even the end of that when I go um, as the sky falls all around us. Uh, because of this current state, especially the past two years, the last line I go, I, I go, and this, and this, uh, and this land has chosen silence because not. I noticed people, that that's in the yeah. TCP version you yeah. sent me. Yeah. That is yeah. that's I, a big I, I, Not enough great. people are talking talking enough for people these days. Yeah. Man, um, I I could do this. I, I could do this with you every week. So Renee, we need a grant to buy helicopters and being and then Bill and I are just going to get our own show. Uh, this was so much fun. November. 
November 5th, Chomp and Stomp is also just one of the greatest events in Atlanta in the fall ever. But go see Waiting for UFOs the following week with Pylon. Oh, my goodness. The, I mean, every great Atlanta band at the Star Bar. And uh, again, nothing but uh, love and respect. And thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, when we stop, we're going to hang on and we're going to say a quick hello to Renee. Thank you so much, my brother. Cheers. Great. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Renee.